We wanted a child, but no child came. When Joan suggested the procedure, I wasn't so sure. It didn't seem natural. She said, what's not natural is that we haven't made a child when we both want it so badly that we dream about it every night. My nightly dream featured a field lined with branches, dogs running ahead of me. Their feet pounded the earth, and the magnet pulled my body along behind them. To anyone watching, I would look like the last dog in a line of dogs disappearing from sight. Meanwhile, Joan claimed to dream that she walked through a hallway of carriages, each carriage filled with sand. When she opened a carriage door, the sand poured around her feet. She had this dream every night and would wake crying if she had a chance to touch the sand, which she described as being very cold. We sat up in bed, sharing a bowl of chocolate pudding in the nude. We stayed up late on those warm, early summer days. We had made a life, but not a child. In the center of our home was our bedroom, and in the center of our bedroom was a wide, extravagant bed, which we had commissioned from a local craft person. A stepladder was mounted to each side. Since the bed had been installed, neither of us wanted to climb down, and we would take our meals there. Joan dipped her spoon into the pudding. She said, I've been thinking about this. It would be nice if you would alert me when you are thinking of things like this, I said. This is your alert, she said. <laughs> I have the supplies ready. She told me of certain creatures in the ocean who undergo this procedure naturally. I thought that we were not those creatures in the ocean, but then how could I be so sure? You might as well show me the supplies, I said. She collapsed onto her naked stomach and scooted toward the stepladder. She was always a handsome woman and only had only recently grown, uh, okay, and had only grown more striking with the sprouting of wiry gray hairs, each reminding me of a sensitive antenna tuned to something I could not see. I recently discovered a gray, almost white hair jutting proudly out of her mons pubis. The other hairs seemed to show the white hair some amount of respect curling below. <laughs> Joan padded to her closet and returned with a shoebox. She placed it at the foot of the bed out of reach before mounting the stepladder again. At the top of the ladder, she got on her belly and scrambled up, rolling toward the center of the bed and padding the must sheets around her. She collected the box, flicked open the lid, and pushed it toward me. Inside the box were half-moon-shaped sewing needles, thick coiled thread, and a hunting knife, and a vial of white powder atop a folded plastic sheet. You found my father's hunting knife, I said. <laughs> it wasn't lost, she said, picking it up. It was encased in its leather sheath, which bore stamped scenes of my family's shepherding history in Wales. This would mean something to me, she said. And what's more, she said, I think this really might work. She was coaxing me into two mesons through the sheet. I held her hand with both of my own. It involves some sacrifice for both of us, she said. She withdrew her hand and took the plastic sheet from the box, spreading it over the comforter. She lay down on the plastic and beckoned to me. This is a woman who lied her way through her education, forging her transcripts to first get an internship she wanted, then a job. She lied to her mother, telling her we had moved to Boston, and then continued to make this claim in phone calls for the next five years. She lied at parties while we were still invited to parties. She would open her mouth to tell a story about a hiking trip through the Andes, and even old friends would turn and walk away. I have never heard her tell one true fact in her life, and at that moment I didn't believe her. I did not believe her, but marriage is built on trust. <laughs> <laughs> not belief. I didn't believe that her plan would work, but I trusted her fully. I entered her with some difficulty, and we held there, looking into each other's eyes while she readied her hand. She touched my hip, kissed my shoulder, when I was positioned properly inside her, she grasped my member with a firm hand and removed it at the base, the knife's clean cut blinding me as if it had severed my optical nerve. I collapsed and felt pressure from her hands holding something to my body, a cloth, 
and upon regaining my vision, saw her injecting herself with the compound, and upon waking some time later, saw her sewing her bloody sex closed, my own still inside, with a hooked suture needle, a look on her face of pure concentration. My body was already closed and cleaned, healing under a fresh bandage. We woke, pale and thirsty, the plastic sheet sticking to our bodies. Joan's breathing stuttered as she moved her head in the crook of my shoulder, and then she was quiet. There were things that we would do for one another, sacrifices we would make, and the proof was now before us as plain as an hour in the day. It was a beautiful morning or afternoon. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, all right. So this this one is real short and it's a little lighter. Uh, it's a it's it's just a, it's a paragraph. Uh, it's called the parade. <clears throat> the parade went so well. We were tasked with saving the town, and for all we care, it worked great. Three towns around us held ceremonies and wrote sprawling, gross musical numbers and basically begged the higher-ups to let them keep their charter and residence, but we had the best idea of all, which was a parade, and would allow us to showcase our local culture or whatever while enjoying a sunny afternoon and involving girls with glitter batons, the high school marching band, kids walking backwards, small cars driven by old men, trucks from the fire department, people rolling hula hoops, women wearing ankle weights, a line of math and science teachers from the high school, the youth choir, followed by the adult choir, followed by the children's choir, a float called Pets that contained everyone's pets, a float called Hospice that contained everyone from Hospice. <laughs> Nice guys eating great sandwiches. <laughs> Local government, regional government representatives, state government representatives, cardboard cutouts, thoughtful flower arrangements carried by our mothers. If the deciding factor was to be which town had the most vibrant culture, we surely won the line of food carts walked by men of Guatemalan, Salvadorian, and Colombian descent. The food carts themselves emptied of food, but filled with t-shirts, which the men tossed into the audience at intervals, each shirt reading, you won, in block letters, and received with such excitement that small fights broke out, nothing too violent, just a bunch of young adults feeling some serious pride for their town and a hope that they would get to keep going to school and enjoying government services for another year to come. And yeah, the choirs were singing, but it wasn't anything they had composed for the occasion, but rather standards of popular music from various golden ages of popular music. Chestnuts which had the crowd up and on their feet, feeling the noise. Oh, happy day, and oh, what a night, with zero allusion to the serious nature of the task at hand. Just a town full of people living vibrant lives. In fact, the banner carried at the opening and end read, just a town full of people living vibrant lives. <laughs> Women hauling garbage bags of ticker tape to their window ledges and dumping it over the crowd. Half of the ticker tape handmade, cut from old evacuation notices. Before we learned that we could buy the stuff by the pound, the ticker tape. 20 bucks for metallic and 10 for tissue. Nice to have a mix of the two so that when the ladies turn over their bags, some of the stuff hangs there in the air for a while, like it's trying to figure out what comes next. Okay. <laughs> Four hundred pages, child death, Isadora Duncan. Yeah, twenty-seven American dollars. Okay, uh, I think this is the last story I'll read. Uh, it's called "The Hostage." Thank you, guys. Also, um, okay, "The Hostage." Nobody knew what to do at first. Deposit slips fluttered to the floor. A man touched the rim of his baseball cap to make sure it was still there. The bank robber seemed just as shocked. There were too many people. He realized that, despite all his preparation, he hadn't considered the afternoon rush. Put your hands up, he said, and people more or less did that. You're all hostages now. 
We don't want to be hostages, someone said. That's not how this works, <laughs> the bank robber said. I come in, you all become hostages, I get some money and leave, and then you're free again. We are afraid, someone else said. The bank robber got it, he was also afraid. <laughs> A bank teller waved her hand, which was still raised above her head. I'll be the hostage, she said. You are already one of many hostages, the bank robber said. Then everyone can go sit in the old vault, she said. There's no way to call for help in there, and it has a heavy iron door. That means fewer people to mess things up, and I can access everything up front. It was a good plan, and made the bank robber feel less like he had screwed up by coming in during the rush. You're sure there are no alert switches or emergency phones in there, he asked. It's 100 years old, she said. You couldn't get a call out of there if you tried. The hostages all turned to see what he would say. He shifted his gun from one hand to the other. Fine, he said. They all went to the old vault, and the hostages filed in silently. There was plenty of room for them to sit or stand. They would be comfortable there. The teller turned an iron wheel to lock them in. All right, she said, let's get to work. She opened every teller station using keys on a ring she kept at her waist. He watched her stack the money in a duffel bag, one of two he had brought for the purpose. He was grateful for her knowledge and assistance, if a little unsettled that she was offering it all so freely. You're not putting a dye pack in there, are you? He asked. The woman turned to look at him, and he was surprised to see that his question seemed to have wounded her. I would never, she said. What would make you say that? I'm sorry. He tried to think about what would make him say it. He had seen a dye pack in a movie once and knew that it could explode and make a terrible mess. There was a lot he didn't know about robbing banks, and every moment was another opportunity to reveal his ignorance. She seemed to sense his hesitation and plucked a pen from one of the teller stations, rolling it across the counter towards him. Why don't you go sit down over there and draft a taunting letter to the police, she said. She pointed to the mortgage officer's desks, which ringed the lobby. He pulled back the leather chair behind one of the desks and sat. It felt funny to be behind a desk. <laughs> Dressed as he was in black fatigues, the bank robber couldn't remember the last time he'd sat behind any desk, and he'd certainly never been near one this nice. He stared at the empty page. Writing had never interested him in school. He, though he knew he had something to say, it gave him an uneasy feeling. He put his gun in the outgoing mail tray and dumped a box of paper clips onto the desk. The woman noticed him stringing together paper clips. You could start with, fuck you pigs, dumb motherfuckers, she said, or, if you want it to be more personal, you could try like, I'm the motherfucking heist king, and you know it. It depends on the tone you want. <laughs> motherfucking heist king, he repeated, writing it down. You're welcome. Yes, he said, a little annoyed. Thank you. He printed motherfucking heist king at the top of the page and then wrote it again and again, trying out different handwriting styles and lining the paper with a chain link pattern. Motherfucking heist king. It really was a nice phrase. Maybe if he could make a design with it, they would get the point of what he was trying to say. What was he trying to say? Anyway, he realized that he hadn't actually considered writing a letter until it was suggested to him. After a while, the teller came out from behind the counter to get his other bag. She looked over his shoulder at the page, which by then was covered in designs of his own creation. Want me to write it? She asked. He handed her the paper and stood, surprised to find himself so irritated at someone who seemed only to want to help him. <laughs> Walking to one of the high windows, he saw that a few police cars had begun to gather. Maybe I should go, he said. She went back behind the counter with a pointed sigh and started to fill the second bag. He watched her poking around the cabinets. Outside, the police were setting up a barricade. I'm going as fast as I can, the teller said. She sounded angry. I have to write your stupid letter and pack up this cash and get everything organized. I'm just one person. I didn't say anything. 
This obviously isn't about me, she said. I've seen this a million times before. You come in here for a little quick cash. You want to make a getaway. Am I wrong? You're the bitch who volunteered. Wow, she said. I guess I must have said something to deserve that. She sounded exactly like his mother, which the bank robber realized was just typical. Maybe you should go and get in the vault now, he said. You've helped me out. I appreciate you. I can take it from here. Yeah, right, she said. You think I'd let you finish this alone? I've done too much for you already to just walk away. I'm in it for the long haul. She threw the last stacks of cash into the duffel so hard that it slid off the counter, sending its, con sending its contents spilling across the floor. He turned back to the window. If he just stayed out of her way, it would be over soon enough. Grumbling, she crouched down to clean it all up. At the very least, she figured, he, he could have helped her when the bag fell. Thinking of others clearly wasn't in his nature. She was actually getting pretty tired of his attitude, his inability to speak up, his dismal lack of self-confidence, his unwillingness to take a stand with either the hostages or the police. He didn't have a point of view or an exit strategy, was content to remain in limbo. It was pathetic, really. When he approached the counter, the blank look on his face sickened her. It was the look of a man completely unable to understand the future or to confront it. What, he asked. She slid the bag across the counter and spread her arms wide, leveling upon him the full power of her scorn. You might as well just fucking shoot me, she said. Thanks. <laughs>